Well, it's always a special time of the year, certainly for us as Christians, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. It's also, it's also a very exciting time of the year for us to hear at Integrity Church because we had our public launch on Easter Sunday morning, uh, 2006. And so uh, that's 13 years ago, and this is our 13th year uh, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ together. And you know what? It never gets old. We just thank God for the opportunity to uh, rejoice in the Son and to be able to do that uh, with you this morning. And so um, what, a, what a joy and a, and a privilege it is. Uh, today we, we celebrate what is perhaps uh, the most significant event that has taken place since the time God said, let there be light. It is that significant. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the, the benchmark of our faith. It is the cornerstone of our confession, the ultimate substantiation of everything the Old Testament pointed to. It substantiates everything that Christ taught. All of that was substantiated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Disprove the resurrection and Christianity collapsed like a house of straw during a hurricane. Perhaps that's why many people and governments and cultures have sought to disprove the resurrection of Jesus, all coming up short of evidence to the contrary, many of which bowing the knee and recognizing that Jesus is exactly who Jesus said he was, very God of very God, finding themselves bowing the knee to his lordship. It is him that we celebrate today. We enjoy the festivities that come with Easter. We engage with our families as rightly we should. We feast around our tables probably more than we need to. But in the backdrop of it all, we recognize that this day was set aside for us to declare Christ's victory over death, hell, and the grave. He is victorious. It is this theme of victory that I want us to focus on this morning. Christ is victorious. The question is often understandably raised, victorious over what? Why is the victory of Christ so necessary to begin with? I think to appreciate Easter Sunday, it'd be wise for us to take a step back a little bit and to maybe zoom out, if you will, like we oftentimes do on our computers or our, our smart pads and kind of zoom out from 30,000 feet and look over a timeline beginning with Genesis and, end, and ending with Revelation. And let's consider Easter in light of this timeline of time as we know it. I think sometimes we, we look at moments like this and we, we zoom in on Easter. We zoom in on the resurrection and we rejoice in that and rightly we ought to. But I think sometimes when we zoom out and we consider read the resurrection of Jesus in light of all that the scripture has to say from Genesis to Revelation, we gain a greater appreciation, a greater love, a greater excitement for what God has done and will do for us. And so this morning, as we, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, we're going to look at it from 30,000 feet and see it on this timeline of time as we know it. And so going back to the very beginning of time, we see Genesis begins to record how it all began. You might have been told in school that it was the result of a big bang, the only bang that took place is when God said, let there be light, and bang, there it was. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. 
And the Spirit of God was hovering out over, over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And in these next number of, of chapters and verses, we see God begin to create. Speaking into existence that which was not creating out of nothing. All that exists. God spoke and the moon and the stars came into being. God spoke and animals, fish and birds of the air and all of the prey. God created all of these things with the word of his mouth. And then in a crescendo of creative genius, God reaches and grabs the dust of the earth and begins to form man into his own image, into his own likeness. Unlike everything else that God created where he spoke these things into existence, this creation would come about a little bit differently. God would touch this creation. Out of the dirt of the ground, God would begin to form a picture that this creation was designed for relationship, to have the touch of God upon his life. And God creates man in his own image. We see in verse seven of chapter two, and the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And notice, the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, as was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God provides an incredible narrative of man's beginning, handcrafted by God himself to have dominion and rulership over the garden. And God invites man to, to enjoy all of that which was created, to eat of the trees of the garden, all except one. Do not eat, he said, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day in which you eat of it, you shall surely die. You see, God was the owner of this garden. Man was placed in the garden to be a steward of it. And the only way that man was able to recognize God's ownership and not his own was to obey the command of the Lord. And man exercises his own authority, places it above God, and does the unthinkable. Instead of a steward, he acts as an owner and decides he's going to enact his own rules and ignore the mandate of God in an act of defiance. He eats of the tree. Many of you know the story that despite the invitation to enjoy all but this tree, despite the very clear instruct from their creator, despite the very loving relationship that they enjoyed with their God, they took their eyes off of everything they had, everything they were allowed to enjoy, and instead they, they shift their eyes over to what they didn't have. They shift their eyes over to what they couldn't have and what they shouldn't have, and they eat of the tree. The results were devastating. The consequences are far-reaching. The payout was more than anything they ever anticipated. As a result of their disobedience towards God, they are, they are removed from the garden. Sin enters into the world, and that which was perfect is marred. And the consequences of death on humanity and all creation is introduced and unleashed in God's perfect garden the very first, for the very first time. Man is helpless. 
The future is hopeless. The crime has been committed. The deed was done. Man is as bad off as man will ever be. Is there any hope? Is there any chance? Can somebody call a timeout? Can someone call for a, a mulligan, a do-over? No. What God said was what was going to play out. There is nothing man can do. And so God does the unthinkable. God does what man could never do. And as we zoom out and we consider our timeline and we see at the very beginning when man defied God, disobeyed God, we see God initiates a plan that would ensure victory, initiates a plan that would reverse the consequences of the cross without taking away or diminishing his holiness or his right standing. We read about this in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 as God is, 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 is communicating the consequences for this sinful action, directing them towards Satan. We read in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. A picture of one who is going to come born of the woman. Another Adam that was going to come that would literally crush the head and the work and the consequence of Satan. Right in the beginning, just as the consequences of sin are being laid out, God promises to bring victory in the defeat of the enemy and a reversal of what took place back in the garden as a result of man's sin. As sin begins to manifest itself over time, as Adam and Eve have children in sin, and their children are born in sin, and their children are born in sin, we see this sin nature, this original sin, is passed on down throughout the generations, and we see two things continuing to increase over time. The vileness and the, the brokenness that sin creates. We see it in our culture today, don't we? We see the, the starvation, we see the disease, we see the, the, the disconnect of humanity, we see man is, is not living according to God's intended design for them. It is all the consequence of sin. And so we see, as time goes forward, we see the ongoing uh, uh, brokenness and vileness of sin. And at the same time, as we look at our timeline back on, we start seeing a promise that is made more and more that the one is going to come. He's going to reverse the curse. There's change on the way. God will declare victory over all of this. And so we see these two things taking place in the scriptures. You know, sometimes we, we see the Bible and we we oftentimes view it, as, view it as a good religious book, a, perhaps a large volume of many chapters. But it is so much more than that. It is not just one book that was created and written by man at one time. What you have in the Bible is a compilation of 66 books written by 40 different people over the course of 1,500 years all brought together at no point is there any contradiction in them. We see a common we, uh, thread woven all throughout Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all throughout the Old Testament into the New Testament, all pointing to the day that one was going to come and reverse that which was destroyed in the garden. And as we look at our timeline and we begin to zoom in on event after event after event, we start to see that God has a plan in the midst of it. We can get caught up in the details and zoom in on the events. But when we zoom back out, we realize this is all part of a plan that God has put in motion. We see prophets of old that would begin to preach and teach and prophesy about one who is going to come. 
As we look at this Bible, we recognize that geographically and historically, we see precision accuracy that is laid out before us. We see the miraculous unity. We see that, the, the, that with prophetic precision, the prophets will speak about events hundreds of years before they will come into fruition. And with dead on accuracy, reveal them as truth. And the prophets centuries before and our timeline would point to one who is going to come and would say, this one, he's going to come. He's going to be born of a virgin. He would be born in this town called Bethlehem. This one who is going to come would be a healer of many. He would be one who would teach by using parables. Hundreds of years before Christ arrived on the scene, the ministry of Jesus, his, his heart and his methods are laid out for them. As we looked at last week on Palm Sunday, with precision accuracy, Zechariah prophesies about the very day that the Messiah would enter into the city streets of Jerusalem and they would wave their palms as they cry out, Hosanna in the highest. And so centuries before, these events. The psalmist talking about the way in which he would die, describing crucifixion. His hands and feet would be pierced with nails, a method of execution that hadn't even been invented yet. But with precision accuracy, starts to speak about this one who would come onto this timeline to fulfill and substantiate victory. And that day came in the midst of a politically charged culture that was seeking to kill every male child that was born. Christ is born to a young virgin girl named Mary. Victory. God steps out of eternity and into time in the person of Jesus. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. The angel declares on our timeline this event. For unto you, Luke records, is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And as he's declaring that, we recognize and we see that suddenly there was an angel with a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Jesus is born, victory is established, the word has been, made, has been made flesh in all of heavens. The veil is opened up and we see the angelic host declaring, glory to God in the highest. God with us, Emmanuel, all on this timeline, this pathway to ultimate victory. And we read that Jesus, he grows in wisdom and, and stature. And as he launches his public ministry at the age of 30, we recognize that he starts his ministry unlike anybody else. Sent out by his father following his baptism as God the Father says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And Jesus launches his public ministry. He teaches like no other before him. He heals the sick just like the prophets said he would. He rebukes the religious leaders of his day. Wouldn't you have loved to have been a fly on the wall as Jesus begins to pinpoint the hypocrisy of the religious leaders of his day. He upholds and embraces the dignity of broken people. He comes alongside um, people caught in the act of adultery, prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners, those that the religious community would shun. Jesus embraces and brings hope and forgiveness and restoration to him. His arrival on the scene was like no other. He preaches freedom to those in bondage. He brings hope to the hopeless. 
peace to the fearful, strength to the weary, and direction to the lost. This Jesus, over the course of just three years of ministry, we see victory after victory after victory. As Jesus fulfills with precision accuracy that which spoke about him centuries earlier. But this wasn't the ultimate reason for which he came. He came to die. He came to, to reestablish that which was lost back in the beginning, back in the garden. He came to reverse the curse so that man who was designed to be in relationship with God might be able to enjoy that relationship with their creator. What Adam destroyed in the garden would be reversed by Jesus, by his death. That's why he came. There was another garden we read about. It was dark. And in this garden, Jesus is in prayer, knowing that the reason for which he came is soon upon him. And knowing the events that would, would soon take place, he, he cries out from the garden of Gethsemane, Father, if there's any other way possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You see, this was another moment of, of victory that we see. No other place in Scripture do we see a clearer display of Christ's humanity. But we see him choose obedience. We see him drink the cup of suffering. Not only to secure his own victory, but to secure victory for you and for me to reverse what took place in the garden. He came to take upon himself a punishment that he did not deserve. A punishment that we did deserve because we who were born in Adam have been born, born in sin, separated from God, under the wrath of Almighty God. Christ took that punishment upon himself on the cross. And he was betrayed by his own. He was rejected by his people. His closest friends that Good Friday scattered. Crucify is what they called for. This man who was innocent of all wrongdoing would receive the most vile of punishments. As not the wrath of man, but the wrath of God was poured upon him. You see, the full wrath, a full display of wrath upon the Son of God did not come by way of a soldier's whip. The wrath of God poured out of the Son did not come by way of a, a fist to his face or the tearing, uh, tearing of his beard. It was not the nails in his hands or his feet or the scourging or the crown of thorns that was placed upon his head or the humiliation that he suffered. The ultimate wrath of God is seen in that cry from the cross as he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was at that moment that all of our sin, all of our guilt, all of our shame was placed on the innocent son of, all, of God. And having borne our sin, he absorbed all the wrath of God that was directed towards us upon himself. And the father turned and the guilt of sin that we were born into is reversed at the cross. In the Garden of Eden, God had one instruct for them. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day in which you eat of it, you shall surely die. Centuries later, God erected another tree and he placed that tree on a hill called the skull, Calvary. 
And on that tree hung the son of almighty God. And the command this time was different. Eat of this tree and you shall surely live. We see the contrast between these two gardens. Jesus declared victory while on that cross to tell a story. He cried out, it is finished. But it didn't end at the cross. Oh, it was accomplished. Oh, it indeed was finished. The price was paid, but the story doesn't end. The victory isn't complete. There are victories all along the way. Many victories that started in time, but will be realized fully in eternity. It was on the cross that Christ presented the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. But the only way we would know that this offering that was presented to God, the suffering Savior presented as a sacrifice for our sins, the only way we would know that it was accepted was life had to come back to the Son. He had to rise again to declare that the offering was approved. It was sufficient. And that's what Easter is all about. Christ coming back and declaring his death paid it all. He's defeated death, hell, and the grave, and he is alive forevermore. The crushing of the serpent that we read about in Genesis is accomplished on Calvary and substantiated by an empty tomb. But it doesn't even end there. As we consider Easter through the lens of, of Revelation, we've been unpacking Revelation these last number of months. This morning we bring that series to a close as it ties so beautifully in with Easter because the theme of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the victorious one. You see, this same Jesus that saved us from the penalty of sin, this same Jesus that saves us from the power of sin, is the same Jesus that is coming again and will save us from the presence of sin. What a day of victory that's going to be. Right now in this arena called time, we are still living amidst the consequences of the sin that took place in the garden, made manifest over time. But there's a day coming where Christ will come and the presence of sin will be gone. As we've been studying the book of Revelation these past few months, we, we see that this church age in which we live is coming to an end that prior to the great tribulation that the scripture speaks about, the church is going to be raptured off of the earth and we will meet the Lord in the air. What a day of victory that's going to be. And following the great tribulation, we will return with the Lord at the second coming and we will rule and reign with him and under him and the dominion that Adam was intended to experience on the earth will be the realization of the redeemed of the Lord as we will rule and reign with him on the earth. Victory will be ours. And following that millennium period, Christ is going to unleash the final judgment on Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet and the fallen angels and he will cast them into the lake of fire and they will remain there forever and ever and ever. Their, their, their defeat will be final and his victory will be forever. It will be the final win, the ultimate victory. John, in, in writing about and seeing what this future home looks like is given this vision on the island of Patmos. What will it be like on that day after the rapture, after the millennium, after the second coming, after the millennium, after Satan and the Antichrist and, and the very presence of sin is removed from the earth? 
Revelation chapter 21, John writes in verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. As we're looking at this timeline, if you will, we see what took place in the garden. We see the prophets pointing to the one who was going to come. We see him coming, Christ our Lord. We see him die on the cross. We see him rise again. We see the church raptured. We see the church living in, 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 in this millennium period. We see at the end of time, Satan and all of his hosts and minions cast into the lake of fire. And then we see the big picture. The reestablishing of what was lost in the garden. He says, look, behold, the dwelling place of God is with men, just the way it was in the beginning when God dwelt and came with his people who walked with God in the cool of the day where man was in relationship and fellowship with God prior to the fall. And God himself will be with them as their God. And look, he says, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death. There shall be no more pain, no more crying. For the former things have passed away. Why? What former things? The consequence of sin. The consequence of the fall. The reality of what we see everywhere. The death, the pain, the cancer, the starvation, the disease, all of the things God never intended to be on this earth, but are the result of the fall when Satan and, and the consequences of sin are, are gone. We are new reality. will have, will show void tears and pain and death, and we will forever be with the Lord. He writes, and he who is seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. He says, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega. It is a declaration of victory. The beginning and the end to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of water of life without payments. The one who conquers will have this heritage I will be his God and he will be my son. We have a picture of what is yet to come. Victory secured by our risen savior for us. John goes a little bit further in chapter 22. He says, look in verse one, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Picture it in your mind, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Look at verse 3. No longer will there be anything accursed. Why? Because he has reversed the curse. We have seen all along the timeline of time as we know it. That is the big picture of what God is doing. Again, so many times we zoom into events. We zoom into, we zoom into specific events, but we must consider these things in light of the bigger picture of what God's story really is. And everything that was accursed will be removed and there'll be nothing that, occur, that is accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face. What a day that will be. No other time do we, know, do we see that we shall see his face, but this time, John declares, and they will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. They will not need light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will forever 
reign for it with him forever and ever and ever. It is a picture of the end of the story as we know it, and yet the beginning of the story. It is a beautiful picture of what is to come, but, but notice as I close what is in the center of the river. It is the tree of life. What tree of life? The same tree of life that has made reference of in the garden. In the beginning of time as we know it, we see in Genesis chapter two, we see the tree of life. As we come to the end of time as we know it in Revelation chapter 22, we see this same tree of life. The bridge between the tree of life in Genesis and the tree of life in Revelation is the cross of Jesus Christ. Dead, buried, and resurrected, victorious for you and for me. He is our risen king. It is the whole picture of Christ victorious over all. Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is all about Christ, our hero, our victor. And because he's victorious, we too are victorious with him. Remember this, this Easter, that Easter's not just about going to church and doing our religious thing. Easter's not just about obeying a bunch of rules and going through the motions. Easter's a reminder that God has reversed that which was lost in the garden so we can walk in the victory that God has for us. And when that day comes where we cross out of time and into eternity, then we will experience the forever that God has for each and every one of us. This place where they'll have no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, and no more death. That has been secured for you and for me on the cross of Jesus Christ substantiated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Victorious, victorious in him and him alone. Let's pray. Lord, you are victorious. And Lord, we declare your victory and we recognize your victory. And Lord, we thank you that you have preserved these scriptures for us to appreciate the significance of why you came, why you died, why you rose again. Father, for many here this morning, we have embraced that reality. And because of that, Easter has sprung up in our hearts as a great day of, of celebration and rejoicing. Perhaps there's some this morning that have not yet made that leap that have not walked across the bridge to experience salvation in Jesus Christ alone. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do a work in the hearts of each and every person in this place. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, today is the day of salvation. This is the opportunity. We are sinners in need of a savior. That's why Christ came and died for us. So what do we do? We confess we're sinners and recognize that there's no other way for forgiveness other than embracing what Jesus did for us on the cross. The scripture says if we'll confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we'll confess the Lord Jesus with our mouth and believe that God raised him from the dead, the scripture says you're saved. That's it. You don't have to join a church. You don't have to jump through hoops. You just have to align yourself with the God who loves you and has a plan and purpose for your life. What better day than Easter Sunday to do that? And Lord, I pray that the hope that we have in Jesus, Lord, would be made manifest in our hearts and pour out of our very pores to the world around us as we greatly anticipate your coming. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen.